Hello. In the 19th century, America was rocked by a horrific case where innocent passers-by fell victim to the murderous, fanatical, and unscrupulous killers. One evening in 1872 in Kansas, Julia Hessler arrived by carriage to visit the Bender family at their old isolated log cabin on the prairie. When the self-proclaimed psychic Kate Bender invited Julia inside, she immediately felt nauseous due to the overpowering stench and the swarming flies. Despite her discomfort, Julia tried to endure and sat across from Kate to begin the seance. As she closed her eyes, Julia suddenly felt dizzy and upon opening them, saw three members of the Bender family quietly standing behind her. Pa Bender held a heavy glinting tool under the candlelight. Terrified, Julia jumped up and fled but stumbled and fell down the front steps. She continued to run through the dark area and was fortunate to escape. When Julia recounted her experience, the neighbors were also unsettled but did not consider it a serious matter. However, the following spring, Julia's fear was confirmed when eight bodies were discovered buried under the Bender family's apple trees. In the mid-1800 Kansas was a chaotic place earning the nickname Bleeding Kansas due to the brutal battles between pro-slavery and anti-slavery factions. Although it had become a state in 1861, Kansas was poorly managed and frequently controlled by corrupt sheriffs and judges. Legal disputes were often settled through violence. Nevertheless, Kansas was also a promised land for refugees. The Homestead Act of 1862 allowed anyone to claim 160 acres of land for a small fee leading many refugees from the eastern cities or Europe to come and build new lives on the frontier. The Bender family German immigrants arrived in southeast Kansas in 1870 and settled near the town of Cherryvale. Little was known about the Bender family's past, except that John Bender was about 5'6 tall and had the nickname Old Brown Beard due to his thick beard that covered most of his face. Mrs. Bender, known as Ma, was tall with sharp, unkind eyes. Neighbors often referred to her as Old Evil. To underscore her unapproachable demeanor, Ma Bender claimed to be able to communicate with the dead, perform spells and exorcisms earning money from travelers. The Benders, being middle-aged, spoke with a heavy German accent and did not speak English well, their eldest son, John Bender Jr., about 25 years old, was a tall, slender man with an attractive appearance. He spoke English with a German accent fairly fluently and had a relatively friendly demeanor, often laughing absent-mindedly, which led many to perceive him as foolish. The most notable member of the Bender family was their daughter, Kate. She was beautiful, friendly, sociable, and spoke English well with a gentle accent. Among the Bender family, Kate was the most attentive to and concerned about the neighbors. She was a self-proclaimed medium who distributed flyers advertising her supernatural powers and healing abilities. Kate also organized seances and lectured on spiritualism, and her growing fame attracted many visitors from afar to the family's boarding house. On their desolate land, the Bender family built a small log cabin, a livestock pen, and dug a well. They hung a sign reading grocery store on the door turning the place into both a stopover and a boarding house. The house was divided into two sections. The front served as a store for essentials like groceries, alcohol, and tobacco, while the back was the family's living quarters and a few small guest rooms. The Bender boarding house attracted many visitors, partly due to Kate's charm and partly because the house's attractive decor enticed passers-by to stop and rest. However, since May 1871, most guests who stayed there disappeared under mysterious circumstances. By 1872, three men were found dead along a wagon trail with their belongings stolen and severe wounds inflicted upon them. Despite this, locals believe these attacks were carried out by a gang of thieves. Kansas was a frontier land with little law enforcement making solitary travel through it perilous. Travelers could disappear or die for various reasons, and sometimes, they even vanished intentionally to start over. Thus, despite the numerous missing persons reports, residents were largely indifferent. However, when the number of sudden disappearances rose to about 10 people in the spring of 1873, including a prominent doctor, 
the authorities began to take notice. When Dr. William York disappeared, his brother Alexander, a wealthy lawyer and politician, hired 75 men to search for information across the state. On March 28, 1873, Colonel Ed York and a friend Johnson arrived at the Bender boarding house. The Bender family admitted that Dr. William had stayed there but had since left. Their story was convincing enough that Colonel Ed had no suspicions and even stayed for dinner with the family. Being treated courteously by John and Kate, Alexander quickly removed them from the list of potential suspects and regarded the Bender family as simple, unworldly farmers. On April 3, 1873, a woman reported to Colonel Ed that Mrs. Bender had threatened her with a knife. Ed and a group of armed men immediately conducted a search of the Bender boarding house. Mrs. Bender denied all accusations, claiming the accuser had fabricated the story to harm her family. Lacking concrete evidence, Ed was forced to release the Bender family. A few weeks later, the town convened to discuss the Bender boarding house. On that day, both Bender men attended the meeting, and a decision was made to search all boarding houses around Drum Creek. When this decision was made, the Bender men did not object, but quietly left. Shortly afterward, the Bender family hurriedly loaded their belongings onto a wagon and fled, beginning a life of wandering. Their absence went unnoticed for a month until neighbor Billy Tolley noticed their animals were starving. Billy examined the abandoned house and almost fainted from the stench of decay. He then drove into town to inform the responsible person, Leroy Dick. When the secret compartment under the bed was opened, the true nature of the disappearances was revealed. The entrance to the pit was stained with blood. They had used a sledgehammer to break through the stone floor, but found no bodies concluding that the foul odor came from blood having seeped into the ground. The townspeople did not give up and continued digging around the house discovering the first body of Dr. William York with his head crushed and throat slit in the Bender family's lush apple orchard. Eight more bodies were later discovered on the property including three men and a one-year-old girl. Most of the bodies were found in a state similar to Dr. York's. The Bender family was believed to have lured travelers to stay overnight. When guests dined, they would sit facing away from a large curtain that separated the guest area from the living quarters. Meanwhile, Kate would charm the guests with her soft and natural speech. While the guests focused their attention on Kate, Mr. Bender and his son would hide behind the curtain and suddenly strike them on the head with a hammer. Mrs. Bender would then take all the victim's valuables and clean up the scene during the night, burying the bodies in the garden behind the house. These speculations about the Bender family's methods of deception and murder were further confirmed by accounts from those who were lucky enough to survive. Two men who had visited the boarding house to hear Kate Bender talk about spiritual matters stayed for dinner but refused to sit at the table near the curtain, opting instead to eat at the main counter of the store. Kate then became aggressive and unpleasant, and soon the men from the Bender family emerged from behind the curtain. The guests felt uneasy and hurriedly left, which was almost certainly a decision that saved their lives. According to the Kansas State Police, the Bender family's motive was financial gain. Travelers often carried cash and valuables, and anything from horses to tools could be sold for money on the prairie. However, with the number of cases involved, the Bender family only accumulated about $4,600 and two wagons. Since some victims did not carry many valuables, it was speculated that the Bender family might have committed these crimes for the thrill and excitement of the act itself. As news of the Bender family's murders spread across the plains, the governor of Kansas announced a $2,000 reward for their capture. However, this reward was deemed insufficient and the pursuit was too late as the Bender family had already had a month to flee. They traveled south through tribal lands where white settlers were not prosecuted, eventually reaching Denison, Texas. Denison was even more lawless than other places. The population consisted mostly of horse thieves, cattle rustlers, and prostitutes. Denison fell under the jurisdiction of the Western District Court of Arkansas, presided over by a notoriously corrupt judge with few resources to pursue criminals, making the Bender family feel secure there. Initially, Kate and Mrs. Bender dressed as men and used aliases, but shortly after they stopped trying to hide their sinister identities. The residents of Denison were indifferent despite the Bender family being cursed nationwide. 
In the following decades, the Bender family was believed to have appeared throughout the Southwest, in Texas, Oklahoma, New Mexico, and Colorado. They lived on tribal lands and outlaw camps in barren canyons and remote areas where only the most daring would venture. They were heavily armed, each carrying a rifle capable of taking down a buffalo. In Oklahoma, a detective from the Pinkerton National Detective Agency traced the Bender family to the Wichita Mountains and then vanished without a trace. A bounty hunter in Texas met the same fate pursuing the Bender family to the Red River before disappearing. In 1884, an elderly man matching John Bender's description was arrested in Montana for murder, with the victim killed by a hammer blow to the head. Identification requests were sent to Cherryvale, but to evade the chains holding him, the suspect had severed his own foot leading to death by blood loss. By the time information from Cherryvale arrived, identification could no longer be performed due to the advanced state of decomposition. Although there were no personal documents or a confirmed identity, the skull of the man was displayed as Pa Bender in a bar in Salmon until it was ordered to be shut down in 1920. Afterward, the skull also disappeared. About a decade later, Kansas was again shaken by a massacre linked to the Kelly family. A prominent criminal investigator at the time claimed that all information about the arrest of the Bender family was fabricated by a Southern Alliance group who also helped Bender dispose of the victim's horses and wagons. In reality, Mr. Kelly was actually the Bender family, as he pointed out similarities in methods, family size, and characteristics between the two families. The story of this infamous criminal family was recorded by author Susan Jonusas in her book Hell's Half Acre. The Untold Story of the Bender Family, a Serial Killer Family on the American Frontier. An inspection of the Bender family's boarding house revealed three hammers, a shoemaker's hammer, a claw hammer, and a sledgehammer, which matched the indentations on several skulls. These items were donated to the Bender Museum in Cherryvale, Kansas in 1967. However, the museum later became controversial because some locals opposed the town being known for the horrific crimes associated with the Bender family. The artifacts were eventually transferred to the Cherryville Museum, where they are displayed in a glass case to this day. Most of the victims killed by the Bender family could not be identified, and they were reburied at the foot of a small hill about 1.6 kilometers southeast of the Bender family orchard. This site is known as the Bender's Mounds. It can be concluded that the crimes of the Bender family were never brought to justice, and their ultimate fate remains a mystery in history. What do you think about this story? Please leave your thoughts below for everyone to see, and don't forget to support us by liking the video and subscribing to the channel. Thank you for watching, goodbye.